Mark Hockland there getting to the core of the issue. Well, over the past two days, Scotland's first minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has been on an official visit to Ireland. Like us, Scotland is currently trying to deal with the implications of Brexit. Although the UK voted to leave the EU, 62% of Scottish people voted to stay in. And their first minister is lobbying to remain part of the single market. Well, yesterday I spoke to Nicola Sturgeon and I put it to her that the Brexit vote had left her in, in un, uncharted territory. We're exploring options to see whether it might be possible for Scotland to remain in the single market even if the UK leaves. Now, I don't say for a, a second that that will be an easy option. There will be a number of complications and practical difficulties. So what we're doing just now is examining ways in which those practical difficulties can be overcome. But for instance, you speak sometimes about the European Free Trade Agreement in Norway as possibly a way of going forward. But that's a club of sovereign member states. Sure. And Scotland simply that's, isn't that. Th that. That's one of the practical challenges we would have to overcome. It's not the only one, but it's one of them. And we're looking imaginatively and innovatively at whether there might be ways to overcome some of those challenges. And of course, on the particular issue you raise, and you're absolutely right to raise it, the Faroe Islands right now, not a sovereign state, part of Denmark, is currently looking at whether it could join the European Free Trade Agreement. So, you know, there are some precedents emerging. Your counterpart in Wales, Carwin Jones, he said, and I quote, I can't see how there can be separate market access arrangements for the different nations within the UK that share the same landmass. But part of our task is to find if there are ways to overcome these uh, difficulties. Now, you know, we know, and I, I, I'm very hesitant to draw uh, too uh, firm a, a parallel between the Irish situation and what might happen elsewhere in the UK, but we know there are going to need uh, to be special arrangements found, and, and I hope they will be found, to deal with the border issues in Ireland. Gibraltar is also going to have to have uh, arrangements to deal with its particular circumstances and uh, in relation to Spain, for example. So Brexit poses a whole range of very complex uh, problems and challenges, but the alternative to, to, to trying to find ways to overcome these challenges is simply to accept the inevitable damage that's going to be done. Post-Brexit, the indications are that there hasn't been an increase in the number of people wanting independence for Scotland. Well, I think almost every, if not absolutely every poll that we've had on the question of independence since the referendum two years ago has shown support for independence at a higher level than it was on referendum day. So, you know... But we're, still we're not, not enough well, for look, independence. If, if Scotland is going to examine again the question of independence because of the situation we've been put in, then that will be a debate Scotland has about what is the best future. And the choice may be staying part of a UK that is about to take a, a step off a, a Brexit cliff with all the damage to our economy, our place in the world, or a better, more stable alternative by Scotland taking control over our own future. You're here on a visit to Ireland as a friend of Ireland. There's very close connections between your country and my country. But in fact, we're also competitors. Of course we are. So when, but when you say, oh, you want Irish businesses to look at what Scotland has to offer, isn't the reality that Irish people want Irish businesses to invest here in Ireland, yeah, not of in Scotland? I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, Scotland and Ireland are, are, are friends, allies, family, you know, those links go back generations. And I think in the future they'll get stronger. And I think there's many areas where we can work even more closely together. Of course, there'll be a competitive element to that as well. That's the case for all countries. But and particularly in relation to foreign direct investment, we compete a lot. Of course, as do, no doubt, Belfast and Dublin and Edinburgh and London. London, um, as well as Edinburgh, Glasgow and, and Dublin. That's that's in the nature of a, a global economy. But isn't there a danger that if you did succeed in getting a special position for Scotland, you'd end up with a hard border of some sort? No, I, 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 don't, I, I don't believe that is inevitable. And I'll be very clear about it. I'm, I'm not advocating single market membership instead of free trade across the UK. I'm advocating it in addition to free trade across the UK. And as, as I say, I'm very hesitant to draw firm parallels between Ireland and other parts of the UK. But, you know, we have a Prime Minister uh, right now in, in the UK that is very firm that the UK being out of the EU but the Republic of Ireland continuing to be in the EU doesn't mean an inevitable hard border between the north and south of, of Ireland. So I don't think these things are inevitable if there is the will to work to find ways around them. As First Minister of Scotland, you're regarded and described as the third most powerful woman in the United Kingdom. Forbes lists you as the 50th most important and powerful woman in the world. Why do you think it is so, though, 
that many national parliaments, including our own here in Ireland, has such small representation compared to men still? Well, let me start with the positive, because you know I, I always like to, 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 to be glass half full. Ireland and Scotland have made strides forward, so there are improvements. I guess the reason, though, why we've still got a long way to go is because you know we are trying to overcome generations of underrepresentation and and inequality. So often that takes a, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of cultural change along the way. And improving childcare is one of the, mm -hmm. the key objectives that I've set as First Minister. It's great for children to have good quality childcare, but it revolutionises a woman's ability to get back to work after having children. Your First Minister of Scotland, Theresa May, is the UK Prime Minister. Angela Merkel is the German Chancellor. All very powerful positions in the world today. Do you think it is important that women hold those important positions. Yes, absolutely, I, and, and women should hold these positions on merit. Uh, and you know, when I became first minister, I appointed a cabinet that was gender balanced, fifty percent women, fifty percent men. And I actually got lots of letters afterwards asking how I knew all the women in my cabinet were there on merit. Uh, not a single letter asked me how I knew all the men were there on merit. We're more than fifty percent of the population, so you know, there's no reason why that we shouldn't have equal representation on merit. But it's important that we have women in senior roles in politics, in business, in academia, in all areas of our society to provide the role models for the next generation. First Minister, thank you very thank much you. for talking to me today. Nicola Sturgeon there. Well, that's it for tonight. And on Thursday, we'd, we'll be devoting the entire programme to trace the growth of the Kinahan crime empire.